Started. Great. Welcome to Plan Stage Weekly, April 1st. Uh, looks like Kong is on. Great. Uh, so let's start. Oh, never mind. Let's start with whatever Gabe is typing. Uh, without like making the same mistake of naming names or whatever, uh, do we, we have an update on the project management engineering manager? Yes, we do. Hiring Sorry, person. I should have added this. Um, yeah, so it happened this week. We have somebody, I'll use initials, JL, who's uh, signed this week. So he starts on... 11th of March or May, sorry, um, or the 7th. I'm not quite sure. One of those two. Um, and he's based in the United States. So he'll be in that time zone. Oh, thank you. Um, so it's me next, I think. So I'm just going to give a quick demo of the um, roadmap expand epics feature which was recently merged just going to share my screen now so here we have uh, the roadmap and what's new is that for um, roadmap for epics that have child epics you now have this uh, chevron at the side to indicate that you can expand it and also to the right of the details section, uh, you have this new icon, which tells you how many child epics that epic has. So by clicking the chevron, you can expand to see all the child epics on the roadmap. And that's it. Uh, that's amazing. What happens when there's like nested sub epics? Is it same thing? nested sub epics um it only displays the next level of child of children so um it won't show the children of these children if that was what you're you were asking yes that was what i was asking do we have plans to do that or i guess what are the constraints of looking at doing that uh, i personally do not know um maybe um someone else may know the answer to that. So like right now it shows the top epic to be ending and then the child epic to be starting. Is that is that to be adjusted or does it make sense? Like the parent epic seems to be ending and then the child epic to begin. Um, so like I would expect the, the parent epic to be ending when the second child epic ends or something like that. So like on May 31st? Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question. Theoretically, the parent epic can't complete until the two children are completed, and therefore the, the status bar for the parent, I would have expected to have gone through the end of the ch all child epics to encompass them. That's a fun byproduct of um, allowing people to fix their epic dates. Uh, well, if these were inherited, it would do that. But because they're not inherited, why it's... Okay. Yep. Discourage inherited, or we should discourage fixed dates unless absolutely necessary, basically. I agree. This is really cool. I don't like, uh, I was talking to a customer yesterday and we were showing them the progress reporting and their next question was like, well, why can't I drill down to see more? And we're like, oh, well, that's coming soon. So this is a huge step in the right direction and I think it's going to be received well, so. Alexis, do you know plans of showing uh, sub epics, sub sub epics, grandchildren? I think this is this is MVC, and then we think about the implications of that because you see the child epics on the on the roadmap itself too, as like a parent epic as well. So <laughs> there's a little bit more work involved there. Yeah, I would almost want to hide all the children. And then like, if you search for it, or, or I don't know, it just seems, yeah, we'll have to figure that out. But um, this is a step in the right direction at least. So kudos. Yeah, I wanna echo that. This is excellent. Thank you so much for the hard work on this. 
That's great. Uh, just a quick question on that. Like, are those sub epics loaded, lazy loaded, or are they all loaded but sorted on the front end? Uh, uh, right yeah. now, they're all uh, loaded at once, so nothing's lazy loaded at the moment. Cool, thanks. That might be a way to help the performance implications if we make it so that you only can see nested if you expand, and then we can just lazy load each subset of epics at a time. So we're only loading the top level first, because um, I know we had performance problems that might help address it. Another thing we're looking into is um, allowing users to set time frames, so they're not looking at like basically every time, <laughs> every time frame ever. It would just be the time frame they care about, and then maybe a future iteration could be allowing them to kind of brush and zoom within that time frame as well. So I think that will help performance. Yeah, that'd be good. Just to clarify, so at the moment we load the wall epic tree except sub epics uh, when loading the roadmap. Can I see that again, sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm asking just because there was a related uh, issue or feature request to be able to expand the wall epic tree where we could probably reuse this functionality if we could just uh, run multiple uh, multiple requests i guess we do the same on roadmap page to to load different levels so perhaps we can use it there too Yeah, what are we doing right now? Because the limit I think on the GraphQL request is a hundred. So are we? Did we expand? Did we extend that to? Yeah, that? for a roadmap, there is an exception to accept two thousand uh, two thousand limit. I think there yeah. is somewhere uh, somewhere a feature request to make a roadmap uh, requests paginated but I suppose that it's not implemented yet. Gotcha. Cool. Any other questions on this? Awesome. Well, great job, team. OK, next demo. This one will be a quick demo. Um, I don't think it's pretty early for Scott. Uh, so I'll go ahead and take it. But let me show you my screen. All right, so this one's around the order in which we see uh, comments or discussions. Um, so previously, and I'm pretty excited for this one because um, my scroll wheel is terrible. So when you get that super long list of uh, um, comments and you just want to or I'm normally at the bottom to see the most updated one and then I have to scroll back to the discussion on the top it's just a huge hassle uh, so Scott worked on the front end for this um, and this one was actually all front end I believe uh, so far um, but this is just uh, adding a setting to reverse the order um, so by default it went oldest first um, and this is I just activated this within our plan uh, project um, so now we have this here that says oldest first, we switch it to newest first, that reverses, it also reverses the um, the input field here. Um, but as you can see, now we have the most recent one on top, which is nice. Um, the reason why I have not turned this on for all of gitlab.com yet is because we do want to save uh, this setting. Uh, so they're not having to switch. So it's not on an issue by issue. Um, case, which it is right now. Um, but Scott's working on, and I think the MR may have already been merged in, uh, but using local storage to um, save the user's uh, preference there. That's all there is on that one. Any questions on it? Um, do we make sure that the, I have, I'll play around with this, but like that the hotkeys and stuff like that, that um, will fo like autofocus the response or the comment? box and everything still work when it's in this mode? Uh, that is a good question. Um, 
I'll put it through the paces in, yeah. in, our, in the planning project. Um, this is really awesome too. Like this has been a huge internal request. And I think we wanted to treat it as an experiment to see if like what, what the same default would be eventually. Um, so use cases was largely around people who are doing incident management and like don't want to look at the entire history, but like need the last few things and then to respond to the next thing. So uh, I think it'll help expand some of those other workflows um, and I'm excited about it. Uh, this is all done on front end side, the, the rewarding, right? Yes, that's correct. Then like if we add pagination, that will not be working too well, I guess. For discussions? Yeah, for, for the commands, I'm, I'm assuming like, there are issues that have a lot, a lot of comments, and we, I think we have some issue, some issue with adding pagination. Um, yeah, so there's an issue on increasing the performance of um, discussions. Um, I don't know if there's one specifically to, with a solution of using pagination, um, but doing something like lazy loading of, of notes. Um, and yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to figure that out when we start work on, on that. I think if the uh, if we're saving at least their preference on the front end, we maybe just need to update the pad the pages to accept this. Do we already do ascending or descending order? Because wouldn't we just accept it in the reversed order, basically, or like query in reverse order? Yeah, we should be able yeah. to. Cool. Mm, sorry, I missed the uh, earlier part of the call. Uh, probably due to daylight saving times, like I was under the impression it would be 8 p.m. IST and the call was an hour early, so totally missed it. So following up on pagination, I'm not sure if uh, Donald brought it up uh, around the pagination that we are trying to do on requirements management. So uh, before I put it on the agenda, I'll uh, quickly demonstrate on uh, requirements management that what we are trying to achieve here. So basically, uh, requirements list currently shows all the results as it is based on the code that we have in master branch. Uh, but I started work on adding pagination support on the list. And uh, since requirements is a new product area and probably the only product area where the listing of the page happens via Vue.js and we are fetching the list of requirements asynchronously instead of uh, rendering the list using Rails helpers. Like if you look at issues list, MRs list, or even uh, Epics list, uh, all those list pages render the items using Rails helpers. So the pagination is taken care of by the backend uh, during the rendering as well as how the page numbers and everything works. One thing that comes for free with that approach is that you get the URL that can be permalinked in a way. So if you go to issues page on any project currently, which has more than 20 issues, then you can click on next page and it will take you to the second page and you can see that the URL gets updated with the page number. So that way you can share that URL to someone and uh, they can open that URL and they are guaranteed to land on the that specific page uh, at the time of opening the URL. And in case of GraphQL, since the entire rendering happens on the client side, like we make the request, we fetch the first page items and then we render it on UI. We need to manually take care of pagination as well in way that URL can still be permalinked so that someone can copy the URL and then can ensure that they are on the right uh, URL. So I'll quickly demonstrate on uh, how it currently works at the moment. Uh, this is something that uh, we haven't pushed on the MR branch yet. I'll be pushing it later today. But just to give you an idea on how it differs compared to what we have on issues and MR pages. So right now I am on this page. Uh, so I'm currently setting the page size to only have first five items instead of 20 items. Obviously once this MR gets merged, we will default to 20 items on the list. So this particular project has uh, 25 uh, requirements and we are showing recent five requirements since our page size is five. And based on that, the pagination bar here shows the number of pages that we have. Now, when you click on next, notice that we do not reload the entire page. Instead, we just make another request with the new page number. And now first, uh, second page consisting of next five items on the list show up. And at the same time, we are also updating the URL. So as you can see that on the, in the URL, there are two query params appended. One is next, and then there is this string, which is a cursor value. And then there is this page number, which is two. And uh, when I click on next again, 
the string again updates. If I click on previous, it will go back to the previous page, will fetch in whatever that was on the second page. And then if I go to previous again, it will again basically go back to the previous page. So this is how the URL differs compared to what we have in issues page. Like right now, if I go to issues page, so for example, if I change it to, I basically remove all the parents here and just reload the page. This particular issues uh, project has uh, 36 issues. So if I click on next, uh, it reloads the entire page and then the page number changes. There is no cursor value present here. Although we have page number and cursor both present, the param that is responsible for fetching results for a specific page is this previous and the cursor value. So I just wanted to know the thoughts of rest of the team, like whether you like this approach, which is not very consistent with the rest of the places, or if at all, do we need pagination even with this kind of approach on requirements? Like at the start, we can still be fine without pagination on requirements. Like obviously this feature is still behind flag and nobody's using it except for us. Uh, but once we do end up with more requirements, like uh, Jan can probably chime in, like what is the hard limit on the page size that we have set currently for requirements globally uh, in our code base? Because right now on the client side, I am setting requirements, uh, page size is 20, but I, I'm sure there is some hard limit similar yeah, to what we had in case of roadmap. Uh, hard limit is 100, I believe. Yeah. So uh, obviously like once we end up with more than 100 requirements, we would need a way to incorporate pagination in some way. So we are starting with 20 to begin with, but at the same time, we want to preserve the URL behavior like it does in other places. So just wanted to know like whether it is fine to have this kind of approach where we are exposing the cursor string as a part of URL. As frankly, there is no alternative way apart from this. Like you cannot just get rid of this previous and just work with page number to work to make the pagination work on the page. So these are only possible option as of now, but is it fine to have this kind of approach? Because there are other caveats as well. Like right now we are updating query param URLs without reloading the page. And this is something that requires us to use certain browser APIs. Like we are updating browser history API to change the values of URLs. So for example, if I click on next and now click on back, you can see that the page doesn't update. It just changes the URL. So we'll need some sort of front end implementation to make sure that when user clicks on back within the browser, the page also updates uh, the contents, not just the URL. So these are some problems that we are trying to solve here because that isn't the case when it comes to issues. Like when you click on back button in the issues page, since the entire page got reloaded, it comes naturally like the history is maintained as a part of uh, how the page is rendered. Like I clicked on back and it reverted back to previous URL and the results also reflect the same. Yeah. I think we can use push state though to um, update the history, so, right? Yes, yeah, so, so uh, we, we do use push state, just that the, the idea of having history dot push state as an API was to use with hashtags. And unlike other places, we are not using hashtags here. Like if you go to web ID today, and if you open any file, then the state of the web ID is preserved in a hashtag essentially. So when you do back and forward, hashtag events are propagated correctly into the front end app and app is aware of those hashtag changes which is not the case here. Like here we are updating query params right away because we don't want to introduce a new way to handle query parameters just for the requirements list page. Like you, you can notice immediately we have here question mark, which denotes that these are query parameters and not the hashtag parameters. So if we were to change it by a hashtag, then we would have to deal with hash and then probably our page would behave correctly, but it would further deviate the design of this page compared to other places. Like in other places, we do not have hashtag mechanism at all. So if we are fine with those inconsistencies between the two sides of things, like requirements is obviously a new area, but at the same time, people are going to look at it similar to how other listing pages work, like issues and MRs are adjacent to requirements list. So you want to make sure we are consistent to other places as much as possible. Like we do not want to introduce an entirely new approach just because it's a new product area. If I share that URL, so if I page forward three pages and I share the URL, copy the URL and share it with somebody else, will it automatically go to say page three? 
Yeah, yeah. So if I copy this URL, I open an incognito page, and uh, if I open it, yeah, obviously it is going to ask me to sign in. <laughs> Let me open a different tab here. Yeah. So as you can see that I copied what, whatever that was there on third page and just opened it here. And uh, there it is. It directly dropped me on the third page and uh, provided me with the values which were present on the third page. So obviously we are using these values and passing it on as query params to the app while it gets initialized and passing on those values into the query as well. So the app is aware like what page user was on based on the parameter values that were present. Just that I didn't want to introduce hashtag based navigation or pagination mechanism here because it would be entirely different from what we have in other places. Yeah, if you copy it without the cursor, so just with page three, page equals three. Yeah, it, it, it would render an invalid state where we would still see results from the first page, but the pagination control will show page number as three. So the page number here is more responsible for how this pagination bar looks like. It is not responsible for which page to load here, which is the reason why we had both the params part of the URL. Cool. Yeah, it looks like there's a couple of things to solve, like, but I don't have any problem personally with um, having a different system to issues because we're using GraphQL here anyway, right? Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think eventually, um, down down the road um, issues and MRs and all of our search pages will be migrated to GraphQL. Um, and I think cursor-based pagination is just um, not only in GraphQL, but like searching um, like through Elasticsearch, I think they um, use uh, cursor-based pagination too. So I think um, most um, places we're moving towards cursor-based versus offset or page number um, pagination. Um, I think the only question is, are we okay from a UX perspective of having that uh, cursor in the attached as part of the URL? Um, so one question I had on that though, Kushal and Jan, um, is there any way, so the cursor is huge and a little ugly. Um, is there any way we can use like ID as a cursor? Like ID of the requirements? That's a, that's a good question. I suppose that in theory, yes, uh, but it would be better to check with Brett uh, Walker, who did most of the stuff on GraphQL stuff for pagination, uh, because I think that is just base 64 encoded string, uh, which wraps uh, ID with some model representation. So in theory, it, you should be able to still uh, take uh, requirement ID and encode it uh, in base 64, but uh, I'm not sure if it's preferred way or not, so better to check with him. Like I, I did read through the GraphQL documentation on how cursors need to be like as a, as a standard pattern. And there also it was recommended to encode whatever uh, value that you are taking as source of truth into base 64 string so that you do not end up exposing values that you are not supposed to. Cool. Okay, so are we okay with Alexis? What do you think? Do you have any thoughts on kind of the UX of, of the URL and if it really it matters, I guess, um, that we have that? Uh, pagination dependent on another print, a different print. Maybe, can you ping me in the issue and I'll, I'll think through it. Sure, I'll mention you in the MR itself, uh, which is currently opened and uh, has this entire thing in, in implementation. So you can try it out locally as well. Like how it yeah, works let in me, practice. Let me do a review of it for you. Uh, sure, sure, no problem. Awesome. Thanks for showing that, Kushal. Keenan, are you? Uh, yeah, you are on. Health status? Yeah, I just want to uh, link to a note there. Uh, the leadership team wants to use this for their Q2 OKRs. 
which I think is a really cool opportunity to get some dog food in at that level of some of our features. Um, so just one, just wanted to highlight that. And then of course, if there's anything you need, if you get blocked or you need help or questions, like let's be proactive and reach out quickly and let's, uh, let's get this across the line so we can uh, get that available, available to them uh, as soon as we can so they can uh, use it in their planning process. And then, yeah, just, I feel like we'd be remiss if we don't ask this question every meeting. Uh, dear importer, uh, 1210 in our MVC, like, how are we just feeling about it overall? Any additional things we need to come across that are concerning or how confident are we in it landing? All that fun stuff. It's, I feel like I haven't heard a lot outside of the issue updates and I was wanna know, we should have, we should have a, Recurring combo on it. Keep it top of mind. So from from backend side, it is functional uh, at this point. Um, I did on on GitLab Cob. I did run an import, so it does import, but we still need to work on the UI UX part. So that part is not uh, is not implemented yet, and I, I know we're working on it. So that's I think that's what's kind of left to be sure that we deliver a, 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 an MVC. And there is, there, not to say that there is uh, no backend work to be done there, there is the GraphQL part um, at the very least. And then there is some refactoring that I would really love to do in the MVC, to bring it into MVC uh, in regards to where and how do we store the Jira import progress and all the data associated with it and not store it in the in sort of the legacy tables and, and data structure uh, so that we don't have to do all sorts of migrations afterwards and, and just pile up the, the work on, on, uh, on cleaning that up. So I'd love to get that into and hopefully I'll do so. Um, yeah, so that's, that's on the back end. Yeah, and from my side, I've just been working on uh, creating the various UI screens. Uh, everything's going fine so far. And uh, the most recent thing that I know is that for the Jira import form, there's been discussions on um, how, well, there's been discussions on tweaks on it. So that's uh, the most recent thing that's kind of blocking the front end, I guess, in regards to completing uh, the UI. Okay. Um, Holly, I'm assuming you know about that. Is that anything we need to talk about or get shared out with the team to help move through or you just kind of working through it? Can you repeat the question? I'm so sorry. I was. Oh, you're fine. Uh, we're talking about UI tweaks to the Jira import form. For right. The front end to keep moving forward. Specifically for, so the question um, that we currently have is surrounding the label portion. Um, and I think we've already got it built in that labels are automatically generated. Um, I think what we're kind of trying to sort through right now is what the UI looks like for that particular screen, which I've already got a wireframe in place. I'm just making some minor tweaks to it. Um, but there was a proposal from Alex this morning, which I think is a good proposal. And that's actually what Gabe and I were just chatting about as to what the format for that label needs to be. And the thought was that it would be something like, Jira dash import scope label um, and then have the key and then a date and time stamp. It makes the label like this big, which is something I don't like, um, but it's clear and it's thorough. So the user definitely knows what import um, that label is associated with. It's easy to determine the project. It's a little harder to clarify if they have imported multiple times, which import set you're looking at. So uh, that's why it's kind of long. And I, I don't love the solution, but I think that it's clear. So that's, that's kind of where that discussion is right now. Yeah, well, is it good help? enough? <laughs> would, would it help if instead of a time step in the, in the label, we would have an, an index kind of a, in one, two, three, four, or five. So that'll be more clear, like which import that is in, in the counts kind of. That that could be that could be a more succinct way to show it. Um, more than anything, I want to understand what all of that means to the user. Does it is it meaningful enough to them? Does it do they understand what that information is telling them, and can they easily find um, the issues associated with that information? 
if they need to. So I'm kind of thinking on it today um, and I hope to have a solution in place by the end of the day for this so that we don't hold up Kong. Perfect. Uh, because remind me, I've only had half a cup of coffee, uh, John and Donald. What's our cutoff date? Is it the 15th? 17th. 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 Okay. Yep. So we just, that is not that far away. <laughs> so 13 more days. I think. Huh? Yeah. 10 working days. Or so. Yeah. Okay. So what, what if we cut that down the, the whole UI and, and label and just keep the label that we have right now that I know it's not, it's ugly and not ideal, but it does the work of identifying the imported issues for any specific import. Um, so we can definitely iterate after MVC on that and make the label beautiful and <laughs> with the, all the implied UIs and so on. And I think we might end up doing that. Um, I just can't, I can't move forward without feeling like I spent at least a little bit of time thinking about what the possible consequences are of that decision. So um, that's my plan for now is we probably will move forward with it as is so that we don't have to do any rework um, aside from what Kong has already done on the UI side. But uh, hopefully, hopefully I can just kind of think through any challenges that we might have and prepare for that. Just you can also defer that decision for later if you want, just because I know we talked about it yesterday, but you can more or less redirect to the issues list with a free form like the project key and then a dash and that will and then sort it by created date and that will more or less list all of the correct imported issues uh, in the order in which they were imported. So like mm -hmm. if you didn't want to add the label or worry about that stuff right now, just you can always fall back on that for the NBC and still kind of you get the same basic outcome. So. Yeah, we had talked about that as well. And something I was wondering is if we could do that approach, but in the event that they have to import again, um, could we then provide a label potentially just to help kind of deal? Because that was the one problem with that approach was that it didn't provide clarity into the multiple imports from the same JIRA project into the same GitLab project and how to identify or differentiate between those different imports. Mm -hmm. um, that was the only issue with the key. Yeah. Again, still kind of thinking through it. I got to get this UX showcase stuff out of the way this morning and then I'll be freed up to focus. I was going to ask Holly, do you think we could, you could commit to a decision by like the end of the day to unblock so we can afford? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. That was cool. yes. Thank you. Um, there was a plan. I think Justin, you were going to do like uh, a demo of the thing, like record it on for YouTube or something. So my understanding was we have we have something now that if we lift the feature flag for a project, imports will allow a user to import issues from Jira into GitLab, right? Or am I mistaken? No, I I think it works. <laughs> I uh, I wanted to do like a clean run, like I wanted to go create a new Jira project with a handful of issues just to kind of sure. run through it and see. But I can I can do that today and follow back up in case. I see anything funky, but yeah, on that, whatever that one project is, you, we already lifted the flag on one of one project. Yeah. I'll put it in the doc where it is right now. Uh, working there, so. So, so, so what, just what I'm getting at is that like in whatever it is, like 12 working days or whatever, if we had to, the minimum amount of work that we could do would be to, to default that feature flag to on and we would have a service Okay. that at least in some way uh, imports issues right okay so that, that's yeah no that i get that's the that's good clarity um and that's great because we're that means we check the box before the end of the end of 12 10 which is good i think yeah so i it's really let's just be cognizant of the 10 working days and if there's improvements that we are confident we can get done in that time frame that's great um hammer them out let's get it through um but again like the worst thing that could happen is for this to not work right in by the by the 17th um you're saying don't break what exists don't break it yeah no and i know nobody would obviously do that intentionally but i think we just need to be a little more careful with this one uh because it does have the visibility it does and it's got the there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in it so I, i'm i'm really proud of the team for getting this to where it is now and it's like yeah let's just bring it home um and keep moving forward but go team that's pretty cool i didn't realize we were already at that point i think i just say what what we have and what we've been able to accomplish is fantastic so you know congrats early congrats to all the team to 
who swarmed unnecessarily get this done and everyone else who, who did work to support the people who are swarming so they weren't randomized that as well. We are unsure about stability of additional improvements. Maybe we can put them behind another feature flag, which will be combined with the original one. Just the thought. Yeah, that's what we need to do. Okay, I will. I'll let go. I think Gabe, you're in. You get the next one in the anything. Yeah, so uh, during the planned social call yesterday afternoon, it was proposed that uh, right now we do alternating time zones every other week. So like in my time zone, I have it every other week. Uh, Charlie mentioned that it would be helpful, especially for her as it's like very early in her day, I think, to have a, a better time zone for um, like the APEC area and um, also doing it weekly. So we took a little bit of time yesterday to play some uh, Scribble or Scrabble or was it Scribble? Anyway, it was fun. Scribbler? Um, Scribbler? Yeah. Scribble? Yeah. No, no, it's like Scribble. I think it's Scribble.io or something with the K. Yeah. Uh, but it was super fun. And, and so she just said like, A, it would be nice if it was at a better time slot for her. Uh, and then also um, to do it weekly. And so on Tuesday, it'd be, you know, the times at one time zone on Thursday, it'd be the other time zone and have that be like a standing weekly thing. So I just wanted to check the pulse and see if anyone was interested in doing that. Uh, and if so, what time works best for folks. I would enjoy that. I think the later session on team day was by far the best attended. So it seems to work for most people. Probably the game was more inclusive and fun, but I think probably time had a lot to do with it. So like uh, shifting it, I guess the the one we have in the after, my afternoon, um, like moving it an hour back, or I guess forward, so later in the day. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to say because we've just gone forward an hour um, because of daylight savings. So I, I have no idea what time that makes it. My Gosh, that daylight savings time needs to go away. <laughs> oh yeah. I found like an article. I'll, I'll share it, and it's it's like two hundred and fifty reasons that we need to get rid of it. <laughs> like you read through it and you just get more upset. <laughs> it's still the thing. Okay. Well, I will. I will. Uh, I think it's also good, Justin. It looks like opened up a, a recurring plan team day. Um, I think that that was like a cool thing to do, uh, like a bigger one across everyone. Um, but I'll also open up an issue to get async input from folks in the different time zones about what would work best for them to make sure we can do that. Um, so it was a ton of fun yesterday and I think it's, it's a good thing to do more frequently. So, yeah, no, that was, that was fun. I, I really enjoyed it and it's a good opportunity for at least, you know, me to, and all of us to like, just get to know each other in a different kind of scenario. So all for it. Uh, I think I had the last item and I just, um, I wanted to apologize if my tone in the ad hoc retrospective came across like negative uh, towards in, like any individual on our team. Um, that wasn't my intent at all. I, I'm very passionate about what we're working on and very passionate about our values and uh, about serving our customers well and also being a good team member. And so um, sometimes that can come across as like, I don't, I don't think we're doing anything valuable, which is not the case whatsoever. I think we're doing amazing work. I also, in the spirit of being lean, and uh, I want to continuously improve and focus on doing that. Um, so I just wanted to first apologize and let folks know that the goal is to talk about process improvement and not that um, we're not doing a good job. Um, the other is, uh, is like, how can I help? And if nobody has feedback, that's fine too. But how can I help make that document or that ad hoc, ad hoc retrospective a little bit more inclusive for everyone? So people feel safe and comfortable communicating there. Um, and if you don't have any input or don't want to verbalize it on this call, you can speak to your manager or me directly or my manager. So. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point that I did not comment too much on that, not because I, just because most of the points were kind of touched on. So, uh, yeah, I didn't feel like repeating what was already mentioned makes too much sense. 
try to you know, get a couple emoji there, but yeah. And then one other aspect is I, I saw there was a uh, retro call. I'm not sure if it was based on, on the issue itself or just the retro call on the release. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe it's, I, I didn't receive a, I don't see it in the calendar, in the team calendar. So I'm not sure if it's a team-wide thing or is it a ad hoc kind of thing that happened. So, yeah. When was that, Alex? Are like, you, where did you I think it's probably yesterday. Was it the retrospective on iteration planning? 30, or iteration? 30th of March, I think. Oh yeah, that plan iteration retrospective. Yeah, so um, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, we. Yeah, no, no, no. That was a. Uh, they they are piloting a new set of onboarding tasks and training for new new employees to like lean into iteration, and they asked the PMs and EMs to kind of go through a first round and get feedback. Uh, so that's what that was. Yeah, there wasn't anything specific about us or the team. We just kind of got asked to pilot. And it was really just going through an issue and SID's iteration offer, office hours. Um, and I think it is something we'll want to expand with the team, uh, probably like maybe feature specific conversations, but that was kind of like a trial. So that's what that was. Okay. But, okay. I mean, oh, good yeah, thing. I thought it was based on the, on the uh, retrospective itself, because there were some points touched on that specific, like that were mentioned also in the issue. So I don't know, just felt like it was a retrospective based on that issue. So sorry. But no, no, no. That, that's a fair call out, and I, I, uh, I think I posted it on YouTube so people could watch it. Yeah, I think okay. Alex may have seen my because I made a comment on Gabe's retrospective issue because I thought we had a pretty good discussion. I actually encourage all of you to watch that video because Keenan did post it on YouTube. If you haven't, um, we had a good discussion on like what went well from like a process standpoint uh, with the Jira importer work. Um, so it's something we'll obviously talk about in the formal retro for twelve ten. I'd assume, um, but it was good because we've been doing this training or piloting this training and it gave a good opportunity for us to chat about it. So uh, I'd encourage you to watch it. And if you have suggestions or comments or feedback, um, you can drop it on Gabe's issue or do it elsewhere. But I, I absolutely agree. It's something we I think it'd be valuable for specific features where we feel like we can learn from the process we went through with it. So. Um, yeah, just from my point of view, I'd like to say thanks, Gabe, for uh, for coming in and for saying that. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to go in on on have a read through everything in the issue, and if you have anything to add, please like to add it and like to feel like you can add it uh, to the issue. If you don't feel like you can, of course, contact one of us and um, be happy to reassure you. But it is a blameless retrospective, so. Um, it should be possible for now that we have some uh, some perspective of from Gabe, it would be good to also feed back with some perspective from our side, so we can actually make some improvements to our workflow as a result. Yeah, no, that yeah, that I think it's a good way to put it, John. Like you know, what we do is hard, and we all there's different different parts of it are hard for different roles, and it's hard to for us all to see that and i think retros are a great opportunity for us to like talk through like you know from like the pm side like you know we get asked questions every day that we don't always have the answers to and so when we're blowing everybody up in issues and chats it's not because we're trying to pressure and lean it's just because we're trying to answer questions from the outside and you know sometimes i'll admit i i probably have i, I need to be more cognizant of tone when i ask questions because i got to realize it's being read and not heard um and so yeah, just we'll keep improving together. Just be honest and, you know, have some understand. Yeah, assume good intent. That's I'm really trying to work on that too, um, personally. So, I don't know. I love our team. We're doing good. We'll keep getting better. I think as well, like, it would, sorry, it would be good <laughs> to, um, maybe we could dog food the health status stuff, for example, it'd be good to find ways where we're doing both, where we're um, like feeding back better quality information to PMs, but also protecting our workflows from, um, from interruptions in focus time and things that actually do cost us dearly in terms of um, like how quickly we can ship stuff, you know? So I, I do believe that there are process improvements that optimize both, right? Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we're at time. I don't. I don't want to keep us longer than we need to. But uh, I don't 
That was a good call. Thanks, guys. Or everyone, excuse me. Bye. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.